Welcome to the Cozy Mystery Quartet, comprised of M.L. Erdahl, Linda Hope Lee, Wendy Kendall, and me, Susan McCormick. We are a group of cozy mystery writers who discuss all things cozy. Today, we talk about the hook. Many cozies have a hook or a special theme that allows them to find a niche, even among the niche of cozy readers. Hobbies, crafts, animals, food, profession, all of these can be a hook. Cookie shop owner, quilter, bed and breakfast owner, dog walker, purse designer, wilderness guide, librarian, the list is endless. If the profession is the hook, the profession is usually something with flexible hours to allow for crime investigation. Hooks help readers with similar interests identify with the main character and can provide side characters something in common to tie the story together. Even those readers without particular knowledge of the hook enjoy learning, say, about spices or chocolate. The description of the hook needs to be full and vivid, while at the same time not overwhelm the actual mystery itself. Strong description, but not a blow-by-blow -blow on how to tie a fishing fly. Cozies did not always have hooks, however. Think of the golden age of mystery writers, Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers. No hooks, just people. Interesting people we get to know intimately. It wasn't until the, till the past, past few decades that themed cozies became the rage. Some themes now even revolve around the golden age mystery writers, with the hook being modern day mystery librarians or mystery book clubs. The hook of my Fog Ladies series is that the women are old ladies, senior sleuths, amateur detectives with far too much time on their hands, plus one overworked young doctor in training with no time at all. The books feature all the usual cozy tropes of cats and dogs, tea, gossiped, and baked goods. But aside from the Fog Ladies quilting parties or card games or volunteer projects, there's no theme, no hobby, no craft. Just old lady friends who see each other through. Here is an excerpt from Frances Noonan's point of view. The Fog Ladies had been meeting more than a decade, the group growing larger as each woman became a widow, except for Enid, who just glommed on. First, Alma Gordon's husband died of a coronary, then her own bill, hit by a car crossing Lombard Street on his morning walk. She always thought he would die in the line of duty. She never expected that kind of telephone call once he retired. Then Philip Flynn, a stroke, and Chester Honeycutt, lung cancer. Muriel Bridge, who had died herself the year before, became a widow when her husband died of pneumonia following gallbladder surgery. Five men, all dying before the wives. The Fog Ladies had turned to each other for comfort and for company. And more than 40 years after more than 40 years of marriage, it was an adjustment to be alone. Having these women during the day was a godsend. If only the hours between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. could be filled as well. Oh, how she missed Bill. His smell of wintergreen breath mints and coffee. His smile showing teeth that got more crooked as he grew older. His solidness that softened over the years with all her baked goods. Her molasses cookies being his all-time favorite. The Fog Ladies ate her cookies now. Wendy, what can you tell us about your character? Thanks, Susan. <clears throat> As sleuths, our characters are talented amateurs. Investigation is not their profession, not how they make a living, but they have an interest in it and skills that apply to it. They don't make a living as an investigator. The career they chose tells readers more about them, and their passion for their work appeals to readers who enjoy learning more. It captures a reader's imagination to take something familiar, for example, women's fashion and purses, and then go behind the scenes and find out more. It can take a reader where they've never been. And in my case, bags and fashion can be found everywhere, just like mysteries. Part of the story in Cat Out of the Bag is glimpses into a fashion designer's work. How do they decide on their designs, the materials they'll use, preparing for runway shows? Where do they find inspiration? An author really has to do their research, which can be time-consuming, fascinating, and fun. That's a good test, too. If the author enjoys learning about the character's work world, the wish is that this world will be just as captivating for the reader. I've spent time researching with books, designers' autobiographies, videos, online, talking with today's designers, my own vintage and contemporary collection, and so much more. 
My research continues. There's always more to learn and more places to go as my series grows. Our well-rounded characters' hobbies reflect their passions. Readers may be attracted to the story because that's also their hobby, or they're intrigued by it and want to find out more. Katherine Watson is a longtime purse collector. She's very knowledgeable about the accessories and even declares and demonstrates that you can determine personality characteristics based on bags a person carries. Catherine decides to use her collection of purses as the foundation to start a women's history purse museum. She ties purse designs to women's lifestyles through the decades, providing surprising historical insights, what bags were needed for, what materials were used to make them, and so on. She highlights real women who did extraordinary things and those who are making history today. I do this too on the blog I share with my characters. It's called a passion for purses.blogspot.com. A purse museum. Sounds far fetched? Not really. Part of my research for Cat Out of the Bag and the prequel was done on site at the Real Essay Purse Museum in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's one of only three museums of its kind around the world. I got to know the delightful staff and the dynamic owner, Anita Davis, and interviewed them all for my book. Anita is an incredible woman with unending energy, a passion for purses and her community, and she started her purse museum with her own extensive collection. I was fully immersed researching how the museum was run, designed, and completely enjoyed reviewing at length every exhibit throughout the museum. The SA Museum folks enjoyed my book when it was done and gave it a recommendation. Inside every handbag are artifacts, pieces of personality, <clears throat> glimpses of the past, and often the deepest secrets. Vintage purses have a story to tell, and for Wendy Kendall's mystery, these stories unveil more than just personal history. They're the clues to catch a killer. Cozy mysteries are often a celebration of women, their work and their talents, a theme celebrated every day. But in particular, it's appropriate we're talking about this topic this month. March 8th is International Women's Day. The theme for International Women's Day 2021 is Choose to Challenge. A challenged world is an alert world, and from challenge comes change. Cozy mystery sleuths are certainly characters who don't walk away from a challenge. I've found that cozy readers share this trait. Linda, how about your characters? Thank you, Wendy. Since cozy mysteries feature amateur sleuths rather than a detective or police officer who solves crimes for a living, the amateur sleuth's profession creates a unique world in which the crime occurs. The profession also endows him or her with special qualities to solve the crime. A look at published cozy mysteries reveals a variety of these professions. Teacher, tour guide, veterinarian, baker, wedding planner, realtor, just about any profession with the right treatment may be featured in a cozy. How to use the sleuth's profession in determining the crime as well as solving it becomes the writer's challenge. Here are some techniques to use. Number one, have the crime occur in a setting related to the sleuth's profession. In Murder Between the Pages, librarian Nina Foster attends a book release party that ultimately results in murder. In Secrets to Die For, Nina establishes a library in her grandmother's retirement home where a murder soon occurs. Number two, if the sleuth is outside her professional setting, create a crime in which she can use her special skills. For example, in Deadly Reunion, Nina travels with significant other Stephen Craslow to attend his high school reunion. 
When his old friend suddenly dies and poison is suspected, Nina puts her librarian's research skills to use in determining which substance may have been used. Number three, endow the sleuth with characteristics germane to her profession. For example, in a librarian's world, information in its various forms is stored in a particular order. This order brings Nina satisfaction as well as comfort, as expressed in Murder Between the Pages. Quote, After a three-block uphill walk, Nina opened the plate glass door to the Seaview Branch Library and stepped inside. An immediate sense of relief washed over her. She loved the library, and she loved her job. Shelf after shelf, and row upon row of books, all arranged in precise order, offered protection from the chaotic world outside." Unquote. Translating this to her sleuthing, when a crime occurs, the world is then out of order. Nina fell, feels compelled to solve the crime, thus making the world right again. Number four, incorporate the sleuth's special skills in the story's subplots. For example, a subplot in Secrets to Die For is Nina's establishing a library in her grandmother's retirement home. In Deadly Reunion, Nina uses her knowledge of children's books to help Stephen's niece, Katie, prepare for a library storytelling program. Quote, Nina and Katie climbed the steps to the library's front door, and Nina turned her attention to the day's outing. She and Katie were about to have a fun adventure choosing a book for her storytelling program. Unquote. So, weaving these techniques into your story world will strengthen the concept of the sleuth profession as well as create her special world. So Michael, tell us about your sleuth. Thank you, Linda. Like many cozy mystery authors, my Seattle Wilderness Mystery Series begins during a transition in my main character's life. Crystal's dissatisfaction with a career of making copies and filing reports in the corporate world came to a head in this scene when her boss threatened to write her up for being five minutes late. Like meerkats in the African wild, her co-workers popped their heads above their cubicle walls. They sensed trouble. An unexpected anger constricted Crystal's chest and throat. A vision of a life unfulfilled and the dread of 40 more years with Darcy Bray as her boss flashed through her head and ignited a spark. The New Year's resolutions she had just written pulsed in the back of her mind, urging the next words from her mouth. I'm not putting up with this anymore. I've had enough. Her voice was distant, not sounding like her at all. I quit. Crystal had zero plans for her future when she walked out on that job until she stumbled across an advertisement for a wilderness guide position. Like many Pacific Northwesterners, she had spent many days hiking and camping. With some quick thinking and creative resume padding, she bluffed her way into the new job without necessarily having the proper qualifications. Like many cozies inspired by bakers, bookshop owners, and caterers, Crystal turned her hobby into a profession, but with an adventurous twist. The hook for this series is the unique profession for the genre. By utilizing the freshness of my amateur sleuth profession, I was able to deliver a different setting for fans. Whether snowshoeing in a winter wonderland, canoeing through the rainforest, or whitewater rafting, the reader vicariously travels with Crystal's guests on their excursion. But what's a mystery without at least one corpse? As you can imagine, there are a myriad of hazards that can end up with people dying in the forest. Furthermore, being placed in charge of the safety of reckless guests in inherently dangerous situations creates instant tension, as Crystal's responsibility for the untimely death of the victims will inevitably be part of the focus of any investigation. Whether a purse designer, a librarian, a band of retirees with a medical intern, or a wilderness guide, the four of us use the hobbies and professions of our characters to thrust them into the middle of a murder investigation while also giving them unique tools to solve the case. Whether you put pen to paper for your own cozy, put a lot of forethought into what skills you want your own sleuth to have to give them a chance to get to the bottom of the many murder cases they will inevitably solve. Thanks for tuning in. 
please take the time to like our podcast and subscribe to our YouTube channel for updates on our releases. On behalf of Wendy Kendall, Susan McCormick, and Linda Hope Lee, I'm Emil Erdahl.